Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, Carl. So, uh, there's a clock on the wall which has revealed itself to me, um, which seems to have been invisible to many. Uh, um, so, I'll try and keep to time. So, uh, I live in the cornfield surrounded by about a million corn ears, and many people don't know what's going on out there. Two pieces of news from agriculture land. One is the second edition of the book. Uh, I have a co author who is taking complaints and hate mail and all that jazz. So <laughs> send it to him. And the other is we just hired Lana Lazette. I should have mentioned the names of the innocent bystanders who contributed to the talk that I'm going to give, including Derek Holm, my, my colleague, uh, my student Kevin Karsh, uh, Zicheng Liao, my student, and our ex-student, uh, Basha Hedda. So I stuck in a bit of ideology because I was in a vision uh, recognition workshop last week and in the olden days we used to believe that recognition worked by assembling generalized cylinders and then good things happened and we'd be fine. And then we changed our minds because this was all obvious nonsense after about 10 years. And then we started believing a new thing which said object categories are fixed and known and every instance belongs to one category. And you can get good training data, so you fool around with features, bung it in a classifier, and run. And then that comes right. Now, this is also fairly obvious nonsense in ways that are reasonably easy to explain. But there are some unities between these nonsensical views. And these unities are a little worrying. One is this view that recognition is a process that plods through stages, from early vision to mid-level vision to high-level vision. And actually, that's probably not true. Why? Probably what happens is interpreting the visual world is a kind of spaghetti. A little bit of information happens here and it moves to there and another piece comes from here and they all kind of bump into each other and the right thing happens. And I'm actually going to illustrate a piece of spaghetti in, with a reasonably plausible story about materials. So there's sort of a classical view of material estimation which says it's an early visual process, we do some color constancy, we do a bunch of sort of texture discriminative stuff and then we know what things are made of. But I'm going to show you an alternative, which is you figure out a whole bunch of geometric stuff about the world, you figure out an illumination context, and then you can just read the material off. So where does this start? Well, for some years, Derek and I have been thinking about rooms. Why would you think about rooms? People live in rooms. Although the geometries are complex, you can get fairly natural, simple parametric approximations. doesn't matter too much if you get them slightly wrong. You can think about priors from building codes. And objects tend to be made of interesting things, but they're manageable. So uh, about three years ago, Vasha Hedau built this thing where you could figure out, you first figured out a bunch of vanishing points. That's the top row, green, red, blue. And then you could make a rough guess as to what the walls look like. And that's the middle row. So the back wall is yellow, the floor is green, and so on. And the purple stuff is clutter. And then once you've made that estimate, you'd say, well, the clutter isn't going to tell me anything about the room. Uh, now what I'm going to do is ignore the clutter, re-estimate, and I'll get the box of the room automatically. And those boxes are not perfect, but they're moderately good. And they give me a kind of structural and geometric context for a room. So once you've done that, you can build a bed detector. How can you build a bed detector? Well, beds are axis aligned. If I know the orientation of the floor and the walls, then what I can do is figure out deformations of the image that make the sides of the bed, the top of the bed, be frontal, build little detectors in those frames for bits of bed, and then put them all together by a little sort of geometric co-occurrence reasoning. And then we had the world's best bed detector for what, for what it's worth. And it works really pretty well. So we put boxes on top of the beds, and we know where the beds are in the rooms. So what might you do about this? Well, one thing you could do is you could say, well, there's all sorts of other geometric reasoning you could do about a room. So for example, Abhinav Gupta and colleagues said, look, if I've got a picture of a room and I know a little bit of geometry, where the box is, where maybe the bed or furniture is, then I can figure out where people can do things. You can sit with your back on this. You can sit without your back on the lower one with a guy sitting on the purple. Uh, you can lie down in the pink places, 
and you can reach and touch with different kinds of reaches, different colored places. Now, when you look at these pictures, just, Alyosha, put your fingers in your ears. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But um, when you look at these pictures, some of these people are pretty gigantic for the room spaces. And that suggests that estimating this 3D structure involves a little more than sticking on lines on images in about the right place. So the, the scale over there is a little wonky with respect to people. And that's just because it's hard. So then what could you do? Well, what you could do is say, I want to know more about furniture. Now, the problem with furniture, when you say that, is you very quickly discover most pieces of furniture are difficult to tell apart. Sofas look like beds, big fluffy armchairs look like uh, sort of boxy tables, and it's just a mess. So instead, it seems kind of natural to try and parse the room into free space. Here are the boxes that are occupied. This is where you could move. And then later on, when you know, when you know what the boxes are, figure out what kind of box it is. So estimating free space is tricky, of course, because small errors in 2D give really big errors in 3D. But one can do it. So we've got a process for finding boxy objects. We're going to assume that they're axis aligned. A little bit of search will make that go away. Um, you could quantize to a small set of aspect ratios. I don't need to get the aspect ratio exactly right. I just want to know where the boxy object is. And then what I'm going to do is group local cues, little bits of parallel line, corners, and that sort of stuff to find proposal boxes. This is something that might be a box. That might be something that would be a box. Now, when you try this, you discover that there are an awful lot of potential boxes in images. There are lots of little local cues that react to one another. If you build a decent search, you can get a box out of almost anything. And then what you have to do is check which ones are right. And you could do that with contextual cues. You can say, look, you're, you want to be a box over here. What boxes are next to you? What boxes are inside you? What do their scores look like? And we're going to rescore everybody and say, I believe you, but not you. And you can make it discriminative. And then you can refine the boxes. So the refinement is a mildly tricky thing. We would really like to get the box in the right place. The problem is that most furniture is not actually a box. It's a box with little legs that sticks down. And if you get the little legs wrong, then you're not going to get the box right. So what you need to do is, at the bottom of the boxes in the image, search for evidence of legs and move the box around just a little bit to get its position right. And you can do that. You learn a scoring function, you move the base around, you adjust until it looks good, and then the box is improved. And this is stuff that Varsha Hedau has in this year's CVPR. And it really helps. So the top row shows a bunch of automatically determined boxes in rooms, and you can see they're all a little bit wonky with respect to the position on the floor. And on the bottom row, the contrast refinement has been done. So this uh, devious sofa has quite long legs. The original box was in the wrong place. Now we've got it in about the right place. And down here, what you're seeing is estimates of the floor. Right, so this is the initial box. The little green target is the thing you want to put your purple box into. So this is where the box actually is, on the floor, not in the image. So it's a 3D thing. And here's what happens with the refine box. As you refine them, they tend to go into the right place. By the way, um, many of them are wrong. I don't want to imply by these pictures that we get them all right. But you can, in fact, score your ability to identify free space in 3D. And you probably should. That's where free space matters, not in the image. So once we've done all this, we can detect boxes. I'm showing you sort of automated parses of rooms made by the boxy object detector using the room context. Works nicely. What do we do next? So what else is in rooms? And the thing in, that is in rooms and that gets neglected is light. Right? Why? Well, the great hero of studies of illumination in both human and computer vision is standing here on a beach. And then if you look around him, you have a sense that if an object just happened to be there, it would be brightly and uniformly illuminated. Whereas if you went over to this room and you put an object down in this corner, it would be dark because there isn't very much light. But if you put it up here in the front of the scene, it would be a little bit brighter. But if you pushed it back into the corridor under this light source, it would be really very bright. And people have percepts of this form. You can look at a scene and you can say it would be bright over there and it would be dark over there. And Kunrink has demonstrated in some experiments that with all sorts of ifs, ands, and buts, People are moderately good at that. 
Now, what we have is a rough geometric description of a scene. We could get it automatically, but right now for the stuff I'm going to show you, most of it's been marked up. But it's of the same kind that I showed you for rooms. So you figure out the box of the room, you stick a little box in, you know where things are. Now what I want to do is insert objects. So I'm going to do that, and I've inserted a bunch of objects. What's new? It's not that easy to tell, right? So semantics helps a lot. Um, something interesting going on in the projector over here, I think it's uh, reducing my images to six bits, which makes them a little bit worse. You can see some stuff going on there. We don't have toruses on the floor. Right? So that's probably a fake. Nobody really has little bits of geometric knot theory lying on their table, so that's probably a fake. That Buddha has turned up in every computer graphics paper since about 1990, so that's probably a fake. Uh, but what else is fake? So, penguin? Penguin? Anything else? I was about to tell you what audiences did, which is they identify the penguin as a fake. It's not. The crystal ball is the fake. Uh, and we can see that by going backwards and forwards. So I masked it. Penguin was always there. Okay. So how do we do it? Well, it's actually very straightforward, and we got pasted all over the shop by referees for not doing anything complicated, but it's neat and it works, so there you are, you see. I've got an input image, and I, <coughs> I estimate geometry. Now, right now, we estimate geometry by having people mark the top of that table, and they can either take the automatic box estimate and say they like it, or they can fix it. But you could see from the stuff I talked to you about parsing, that maybe that estimation of geometry could be automatic fairly soon. Then having done that, we do something an awful lot like Retinex to figure out the albedos of the surfaces involved. And then we estimate lighting. Right now, nobody has a nice light finder, so we tell people to mark the lighting. And they just mark it on top of the scene. And there's a secret source here, which I'll show you in a second. And then what I'm going to do is I now have a model of the room. Very simple geometric model. Box over here, box on the outside of the room. I stick my assorted pieces of computer graphics into that uh, model. And then I render them with a physical render. A physical render is a wonderful thing. It's nothing to worry about. And then I can pause it. Question? Uh, what happens if your light source is invisible in the image? Um, all sorts of interesting things. Give me a second. I'll show you some examples. The things we can't do, right? Well, I'm happy on that. So one sort of important and really useful thing is re-estimating light parameters, right? So over here you can see this is in fact the initial estimate of geometry rendered with the initial estimate of lighting for this room, and it looks pretty lousy. Um, one reason it looks pretty lousy is that the material estimation algorithm rings in the way of these things, and you can see these funny little ridges in the ceiling that are caused by that. And if you simply took this estimate of the environment, and rendered objects with it, then you get funny, bright-looking bits of geometry that would be a bit funny. So there's a really simple trick here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my illumination position estimates. I'm going to take my... Um, uh, and then I'm going to take my albedo estimate and my box estimate, and I'm going to render that. And then I'm going to move the lights around until the picture looks most like the image I've got. And then I will stop. That gives me a way to duck some of your question, but not all of it. Right? If the light really is coming from space, I'm in trouble. But if there's just a little bit of light that I'm not sure about, I can fix it up like that. And if I do that, things get a whole hell of a lot better. So the light's been moved around. The rendered world still looks a bit funny, but the compositing will take care of that. But because I've moved the light around, my objects look better. These little blue rings have nothing to do with me. Blame the projector, and it's the only projector that's ever done it to me, too. So there's a little blue ring over there, and it's a little blue ring over there, and it's not in the original image. Um, question. Mm, question. When you say move light around, you, I mean... The Literally shift the corners of the yeah, light and change its intensity. That's a bit strange, because the user marked it, right? So it's a correct position. No, I guess you try to, I mean, there's no, a lot of interreflectances and so on. Right? No, no, no. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a very reasonable thing to do. Firstly, the user may not have marked it right. Secondly, there are errors in my geometric representation. Thirdly, there are errors in my material estimation. Right? So what I'm trying to do is say, look, adjust the light so that those errors tend to compensate for each other. If I can get them to compensate for each other, I'm not really about canonical estimation. 
if I can get the, the, the errors to compensate, I'm going to be better. And that's all that's involved. Um, now, there are other things I'm going to want to do as well. So in rooms like this one, there are holes in the ceiling. And they let the light in from the sun. And I want to figure out where they are, because they're going to have illumination effects. How am I going to do that? Well, that's a sort of inverse shadow process. You can think about those as inverse shadows. So we fire up uh, Chi and Dai and Richie Guo's uh, shadow detector. And it tells us those are the light shafts. And then we can render things. Real picture plus extra bits of computer graphic. Uh, real picture, various graphics tat. Uh, real picture, various graphics tat. Real picture, statue inserted. Uh, this one I love. Real picture, statue inserted. See what the skylights do. Very nice sort of pretty effect on the surface. And of course you can do this for movies. That thing started life as a photograph on Flickr. And you can play billiards on the surface and the light looks fine. Right? Why? Because we've got that simple geometric representation and the simple illumination representation. This is, I think, our best movie. Um, that started life as a photograph on Flickr. Little glowing ball wanders into the room, flies around, gets reflected in mirrors, does all sorts of other stuff, casting shadows, and looks right. Now, the important thing about this from the vision perspective is this thing looks really quite good with a very, very limited quality model of the world. Right? Our geometry is simple. Our uh, albedo estimates are almost certainly somewhat wrong. Our lighting estimates are almost certainly somewhat wrong. And it's still, it's fine. So we had some trouble with referees because everybody could spot the errors in the pictures we produced, even if they weren't fake pictures. So then what we did was we did a user study to establish whether people could spot lighting errors. And it's a fairly straightforward thing. Here are two pictures. Uh, for one of them, all of the stuff on the table is fake, in the sense that we took a photograph of a flat table with nothing on it, and then we inserted some computer graphics. For the other one, the objects are actually physical objects on the table, and you just have to choose which is which. Hmm? Uh, and I'm not that good at left and right. This one? Or that one? Remember the pink stuff on the table has to do with the projectors, nothing to do with us. And the little green halo over there. Again, the projector is doing something to the last bit. Um, so you might think that this was a little unnatural. You might also think that that was a little unnatural. You might be worried that this is bright, and that isn't as bright. But it's not that easy to spot which one is right. It turns out that the answer is as follows. I've given up trying to remember it because I get it wrong. Right? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, he didn't estimate the... Um, uh, transmission coefficient just right. Okay, and we did a user study and basically what happens is if you show that test to people for a whole bunch of images, about a third of the time they choose us over the real picture and the rest of the time they choose the re real picture. Remember, chance would be 50%, so we're doing pretty well. Um, now, there's all sorts of neat stuff we can do with an idea like this. So here's the material story starting. And now my story is going to get patchy. I'm just sketching where we're going. The thing about this is I've demonstrated fairly comprehensively that I know where light is in a picture. Right? Why? Because I can stick things in the picture and the light looks right. Now, if I have a photograph of an object where I know some information about its shape, I know all of the light coming in, and I know all of the light going out. The reason I know the light going out is I see it in the picture. So I should be able to make material estimates, like albedo, specular albedo, fong parameters, roughness, that sort of stuff. And the material estimate I want to make is the stuff that modern renderers use. Why? Because a whole lot of stuff is known about how to use it and what to do with it. Uh, that's a photograph of a bunch of spray-painted test spheres. They're always called spheres or test objects after the consequences of not calling them ping-pong spheres. Um, I stuck a little Buddha in that picture. That's a computer graphics Buddha. Now what we do is steal the material from the gold sphere and stick it on the Buddha. Right? He looks good. Uh, if you are really discriminating, you'll notice a very tiny color shift. Again, there are these funny little green things which are not my fault. Um, of course, we might want other materials. So we can steal the material from the red sphere and bung it on the Buddha, and then from the dull blue sphere and from the bronze one. And you'll notice that the gold one is nice and highlighty. The red one is not quite as glossy. 
The blue one is really quite dull, and the bronze one is more highlighted, just the way the paints were. So that's kind of neat. Um, do you have like a zoom in or something? For, right from here, I can only see basically just different colors. Your, your suggestion. Oh, you want the specularities? Look for glossy bits around his um, uh, whatever that is. I don't know. Okay, but you, but you don't have you don't have a like it's not like a textury you know velvet or any kind of material. I haven't shown you any numbers yet. Okay. Okay. They'll get, they'll, we'll get there. I'm not going to show you any numbers today, but we'll get there. Um, okay, now what would we do about more complex materials? So there's a, just a sketch about what you could do with simple material parameters. But materials come with all sorts of really complex spatial phenomena, and we kind of not need to know what to do about it. So here's one potential application. You could try and reshade image fragments instead of reshading geometric objects. And that's obviously much more interesting because the fragments are going to have hair and fur and all sorts of other stuff. So I want to take a segment out of an image, reshade it, and stick it into another picture. How would I do that? Well, some time ago, a bunch of people pointed out, including Alyosha, that it's just wonderful to make pictures out of pieces of other pictures. The problem is, if you choose the things with the wrong shading, then it looks lousy. So if you look over here, this teapot appears to be floating, as does that one. And the ostrich is a bit funny because there's something funny about it. Depth from, uh, the depth of field. We just, these are just plonked on top of the picture. Now, if you do it right, it looks like that. Right? You can see the teapot's casting a shadow. The little green fringes on the shadow have something to do with the projector. The uh, ostrich is out of focus, as it should be. Uh, the other teapot is actually creating a specularity. We're all sort of happy. How would you do that? Well. Really rough shape from contour to get really rough, probably wrong estimate of fragment shape. Then I could get albedo from a retinax like algorithm. And then what I'm going to do is say all of the other stuff about the materials on the surface that I don't know is going to live in detail maps. And those detail maps would be image based. When I reshade, I'm going to reshade the rough shape so the shadow will move from the left to the right. But all of the little hairs on the object, the shadows will be where they're used to for those hairs. But nobody can do that consistency problem anyhow, meaning people can't spot it. You need to be a real specialized uh, photo forgery detector before you can tell. So we're going to sort of hope that that will encode the missing bits. And I'll define my detail maps really simply. It's going to be the fragment minus what I get by relighting that bad shape estimate with the OK but not spectacular albedo estimate and various different inferred lines. And each of these will give me a different detail map. And then I can composite the detail maps back once I've relight, relit the object. And my rendering process is going to be what I did last time. I'll shade the approximate shape with the approximate albedo and the environment lighting. And then at the last moment, I'll add in the detail maps with whatever weights appeal to me. Right? So for example, on the top, I've got a cut and paste of a bunch of little hand-drawn and painted figures on a photograph. And you'll see they seem to sort of sit on top of the photograph. Now, if we do what I described with different amounts of detail, so these are different detail maps, or rather different weights on the detail map, and you can see they appear to be made of different things and different stuff is emphasized, you get a series of different pictures. Whether you like one or the other is largely up to you. However, all of them look like paper cutouts sitting in the space rather than on top of the picture. And you can get quite nice results with these detail maps. So there's a dragon over there. Again, this is an image segment, no 3D model. And you'll see he's got sort of big scales and stuff. We're going to drop him in the room, light him from above, and he's got now his scales stick out, and he's got little specularities and stuff. He really looks pretty good. Uh, we've got a koala bear covered in fur, no hope of doing anything sensible uh, um, fr with shape from shading or anything else. Bung him in there, he looks pretty good again. Sorry, a question. With a previous picture of the dragon, but you, you said it's just a picture? But yeah, it started life as a picture. But, but, but you need all that information. Hmm? So you do have a 3D model of um, The way we get normal information, the only normal information we have is normal information that's smoothed in from the power. We have no other normal information. And that gives us uh, a shape from contour estimate that I can almost guarantee is wrong. That's not wrong in spectacularly bad ways. 
So, for example, because it's lit from above, we know to make this darker than that lighter because it bulges out. But we do not have normal information for this case. Now, there's an interesting question here, which is whether you could get it. And there's some evidence based on the uh, uh, previous material stuff I showed you that you might actually be able to get it. But we don't have it right now. So we put our coil in the snow. Uh, and the graduate student involved confesses he's never seen a penguin, so he doesn't know how big it should be. But that's, again, a, just a segment of a penguin. And he looks pretty good in this. You also have to remove the light on the original photograph was, right, the penguin. I mean, there was... Yeah, that's what the albedo thing is all about. Okay, yeah. Right, and that's where the albedo estimate comes from. Now, the thing about this is you preserve a sense of material in a way that's plausible. So there's sort of suggestions about the representation of material here, which are kind of attractive. But in both these cases, the... Um, original object is lit in ways that are similar. Like, so here it's lit from the, um, the right side of the image. Yeah, and I wish I had a metric for telling you when I was succeeding, because then I could tell you roughly what would blow me up. So sometimes you can get really big changes of light. Other times you're dead. And I don't have any more sensible statement than that. Sorry, Kieran. There seems to be something weird going on with shadows, right? So the tree casts a shadow on the koala? Yeah. And where does that, how does that get computed? We have a shadow detector. This is a room. It's a box. We've got a box. We've got a shadow detector. We know the shadow's on the floor. We know the direction the light is traveling in, so we know this volume. Stick a koala in there, and the intersection gets it. You don't know the geometry of the koala, right? No, but, I've, but you can't do shape from shadows anyhow. And I've got a, a shape from contour estimate of the koala, which is just a bump. Oh, I see. So, so a teddy system. Mm -hmm. like, the, like the teddy system. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Do you have examples where this kind of fails? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, do I have them with me in the slides? No, I, um, not you know, wishing to trot all of my failures out. But I, don't worry, it fails. Well, so <laughs> one, of the things we, one of the things we try to do, and this will give you an idea of what's going on, is faces. And the thing about faces is, depending on how the light moves, you might be OK or you might not. So the coarse shape model is always a bulge. If the light moves a bit, and doesn't reveal the fact in the shadow movement that you don't actually know where the nose is, it's fine. If it moves a lot, you know, from down here, from up there to down there, you are dead. Right? Can I tell you what we can get away with now? I don't know. I'm sorry. So, there seems to be, is, there, is the tree shadow and the koala shadow overlapping behind the koala? Uh, it seems like the tree shadow should not be there. Yes, they are. Um, I think that's a rendering question. Right? The composite, I think, got it right. It's, Probably. I mean, because if it's yeah, not really there, then they should have, I mean, the, the, the right. tree shadow should be removed uh, from, from areas. Yeah, it may, it may be a composting problem. I see. Okay. Question. Do this with image sequences as well? Videos? Oh, I wish. It's the way to make the new um, Clark Gable movie, right? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, maybe next year. Okay. Now, the thing that's kind of fun about this is these detail maps conceal some of your ignorance about shape. So this is a picture from the uh, MIT shape data set. And that's the albedo estimate. So it's flat. It's just albedo. And then up there is our shape estimate. And I'll show you the real picture in a second of the real shape. And you'll see our shape estimate really is pretty hopeless. Um, that's our shape estimate plus a detail map. Right? And it just begins to look like a thing. It's not quite right. So this is the actual uh, uh, this is the actual picture, and that's John Barron's photometric stereo estimate of the shape, which isn't as creasy as you'd like. And in fact, sorry, I'm wrong. That's John Barron's uh, photometric stereo estimate of the shape. This is John's photometric stereo estimate, rendered with albedo and some directed light, and it doesn't quite look like a piece of paper. If we then add our detail map on, it just looks more realistic. Right? That's our shape rendered with our detail map and a light, and that's John's shape. John's shape is better. It helps to get a reasonable shape estimate, but it's not catastrophic to have a lousy one. Okay? Um, give me a second and I'll... So the, I'm, I'm just finishing. And really, uh, firstly, I think this is recognition stuff because we're reasoning about what objects are made of, and that's recognition. But it's not a sequence of steps. Information is sort of wandering around the landscape, picking things up. And the ideology that I imposed last week is we're having trouble talking about early, mid, late vision.
because we don't know what needs what, and we don't really know what's important, and it would be nice to know more about it. Sorry, Karen. Well, just a minor thing. Mm. Was that a photometric serial estimate or a shape of shame estimate? It's a photometric serial estimate. I don't know how John got it. John sat down with the, a bunch of the MIT um, uh, surface uh, intrinsic images data set and did uh, photometric stereo reconstructions to some of them. You might want to, or one might want to argue with him about why there aren't creases, but I rather suspect he's done it well because all the other stuff he's done is done very carefully. But photometric stereo normally looks a lot better than that. Yeah. Um, for a crumpled piece of paper with an LB on top? Yeah. <coughs> it's the one that John is propagating as ground truth. We just took it from him. It's, uh, we, we could try and do our own reconstructions and see if we got it better. So it was my belief that this is worth trying it because people are extremely bad at assessing the consistency of shadow directions between small shadows and large shadows. Uh, you can do all sorts of nonsense when you make photo fake photographs with shadows. So the famous examples of two people standing next to each other and one of them has the nose shadow going this way and the guy on this side has the nose shadow going that way, which means the sun is about 10 feet in front of them. Uh, um, you, the people are really bad at, you know, um, it's dark on my left side and light on my right side, but my nose shadow is going there. And this is a play on that. I don't believe, I've certainly never found anything in the literature that says how bad, at what, and what you can get away, uh, get away with. Uh, there is actually some sort of physics. But yeah, but, you know, the crispness that I was talking about is not really there. The psychophysics that says, uh, yeah, Kavanaugh says shadows are dark, which is helpful, but, you know, within limits. Um, there's a bunch of stuff about shadow inconsistency, and there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, Dan Kirsten and Bayesian shadows. But something that says you can do this and people won't notice, and you can't do that, it's just, it's just not there. Um, the material representation that I'm suggesting here says that at least some of the way you want to think about material is as a, a sort of image-based add-on to cover macroscopic complexity for microscopic detail because you can get away with it. And people just don't notice that you're doing that. Sorry, yeah. So uh, for, the, for the first part of the talk, so uh, it seems like uh, when you're interacting with the scene, you know, moving your light source around right. like that, you're going to start discovering problems. And I'm wondering, in your experience, uh, because you know the geometry maybe is not quite right, or the shadows are not quite right, or something. Uh, in your experience, has how easy is it for those to be fixed? Um, uh, so I, I think it's a very deep question, right? So if you think about a, uh, making a movie like this, if you want to make a nice movie, you really, really want to keep away from the things you don't know. So, for example, imagine I say I want to make a movie of a ball bouncing on the walls of a room. And, you know, with a little bit of care, I can make sure that it follows an ergodic path. It's going to go near every piece of geometry. And eventually, it's going to expose the fact that my model of this wall, for example, is that it's flat without a little step in it. Or it'll expose the fact that, you know, I'm actually thinking of that being flat. Now, from the point of view of geometric and motion stuff, that's a really big deal, right? If you're trying to author pictures, you can, you can duck that question. Uh, from the po photometric point of view, you know, if you are computing lighting computation, does it cost you very much not to know that this is sticking out of the floor? The answer is basically no. Right? To what extent? Nobody knows. I mean, the, some of this is shrouded in, in a bit of mystery. But you can conceal your ignorance really significantly. That means if you want to use scene context to do stuff, you don't necessarily need to get it wrong. But we basically know very little about this picture. And we can do a whole bunch of stuff with it. There are things we can't do. But, you know, the things we can do are the more interesting. Questions? Looks like we're done. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the delirium balls look pretty good. So what would happen if you in the koala one or penguin if you shift it over slightly? 
Um, we've done some. We've already done that uh, because when we cut the fragment out of one picture, we don't actually know what the camera was. Right? So in our shape from contour, we have to introduce deliberate errors to ensure that there is a crease on the bounding contour of the object. Because when we stick it in the new picture, we're actually going to be viewing it from a different viewing direction than the old one. And if we didn't put a crease on the bounding contour, then a whole bunch of pixels would come into view that we don't know anything about. Right? So we, we sort of ducked a bullet over there. The camera has already moved just a little bit. Can you move it more? Probably a little bit. Eventually, when you move it, you expose your ignorance about the shape, just in the same way as if, if you move a light around a head, eventually the fact that you don't know where the nose is is going to become apparent. Right? How much? I don't know. I can't answer. Sir, it would be very interesting to see if you have the scene of the table and the synthetic and the real objects, how um, users would be able to notice if they had several views of the same scene, like two or three or ten views, and how soon they were able to realize that one of the two is a rendering and the other is not. Uh, let me pass over a fact to you which suggests that that would be much messier than you might think. So when we did this user study, this is two alternative forced choice, and we did it because the referees we were dealing with simply wouldn't believe that they couldn't get the answer right. right? So you rack up a bunch of users and then that's a little easier. Uh, um, one of the things we noticed is that people got the answer right more often earlier in the study. Right? So your first couple of pictures you tend to make the judgment right. And then as far as we can tell what happens, and certainly what happened to me, was I thought, gee, this is a reliable cue to what's going wrong. And then I screwed up a whole bunch of other images by basically overgeneralizing on the cue. And there's some mild evidence in our user study that other people were doing that as well. So you know, the question you're asking me has layers of complexity in it that would be very difficult for me to speculate about. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit bold question. Why do you do all of this? I mean, well, what's, the, what's the, the research question would be how to pay people best or how to... No, 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 all sorts of questions. What do you need to know about a picture? Right, that seems like an interesting question. Here's another one. Um, how should I estimate the materials of objects? The usual thing is, you know, you look at the picture, you figure it out. I'm giving you a completely different answer. Figure out the geometric context of the scene, figure out what the light is doing, and you can read all the materials of the object. Uh, there are practical applications, so um, if you have a very expensive leather sofa you want to sell to someone, then they can take a photograph of their living room and you can put your sofa into their living room and it looks like it was there and everybody's happy. So that, you know, that's got practical applications. But I think there are fairly deep questions about vision that our community has very largely chickened out on. Uh, so almost nobody does any shape and shading or talks about it. I, the, today was the first time I've heard about it for years. Uh, intrinsic images, albedo, that sort of stuff, people have been quiet about for decades, with the honorable exception of Ted Adelson and, and Bill Freeman in his recent papers. Uh, um, questions about what light is doing in space and what you know about illumination just haven't been touched. It's palpable that people know something about what illumination is doing in space. But there's evidence in the psychophysical literature back to the 70s, without having objects in But it space. seems you're, you're much more interested in, in perception than in physics. Or, I mean, it no, it's just the physics comes for free. You stick it in a physical renderer and they do it. it uh, we can talk about physical rendering details for hours, but it, you know, we, we know how to do that. We've known for years. Uh, this is, we just use that stuff. We don't, well, I do some of it, but. Probably move on sure, to the yeah. next speaker.